Overflow Church. Are we awake today? Merry Christmas. Y'all doing all right? That is absolutely one of my all-time favorite Christmas movies, and that is the title of my message today. The title of my message is Don't Do Christmas Home Alone. Get it? Nope. Okay, got it. All right, cool. Cheesy pastor jokes. Oh, man, never get a laugh. But yeah. So we're, we're kind of using the story of, of Kevin there, played by Macaulay Culkin, to kind of springboard us into some biblical truths about the story of Christmas. If you have a Bible, open it up. We're going to be preaching, talking, looking at Luke chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 1. Luke chapter what? One. Matthew chapter what? One. That was an easy one, right? Just one, right? But before we dive into that, I, I just want to kind of address something. By the way, if you're new here, my name's Corey, one of the pastors that gets to serve with our family of churches. And today's kind of a special day for me um, because, as many of you know, we got to hand off the baton of leadership here to Pastor Elijah and his incredible family. We're so excited and grateful for you. And Elijah and the team were nice enough to have me back. I've said it before, but I definitely have plans to be the estranged weird uncle that just kind of strolls in randomly and, you know, hangs out. So be, be encouraged. I'm not piecing out for good. Um, I'm just, by the grace of God, able to hand off this lead, amazing church to this incredible team. Pastor Elijah, I'm so grateful for you. Um, but it's my honor and privilege to, to bring the word today. Thank you. I appreciate that. He like th- tried to throw two claps in there and no one was joining him. I'm usually that guy. I'm like, okay. Um, but before we jump into God's word, um, I just want to address something because um, I, I, we're doing this series called Christmas at the Movies. And if it is your first time tuning in online or here in the house, like that may seem a little weird. Like Christmas at the Movies, at church, like why are y'all doing this? We're doing it for a couple reasons. First and foremost, um, it's because like we've been in a pandemic and nobody got to go to the movies and I like movies. And so haha, <laughs> that's what we did. But, but the bigger reason is um, I, I got in, in a creative meeting because we're doing this series with our sister church down in Jamaica called Zeal and another sister church of ours called Central Up in Holland. All three churches are doing this series together. And we were sitting in a creative meeting and I just kind of asked the team. Now the team was made up of church folk. It was made up of of people on staff at church. And the thing with church people is church people know what Christmas is all about. What's Christmas all about? Jesus. Yeah, you don't know the answer in church, just say Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Not just just Jesus, but but Christmas is about the birth of Jesus, which we're gonna get into in a second. It's literally when we celebrate the birthday of Jesus, right? Happy birthday to, it's weird that we don't sing that at Christmas. That should be a Christmas song because it's all about his birthday. Um, That's also why we do this thing called the greatest gift here. You heard Chad talk about it earlier. This is one of the biggest ways God worked on my heart. I I picked this up at another church about 10 years ago and I've carried it with me to every church I go to. Imagine if everybody showed up at your birthday party. Um, Let's see, Dalen, when's your birthday? April 3rd. Everybody mark that in your calendars right now. But imagine if if everybody showed up at your birthday party and they all had presents and they all gave presents to each other and no one brought a present for you, the birthday boy. That would feel weird, right? You'd be like, thanks for coming, guys. Right? Like, (laughs) like, right? And they even like brought a cake and then they uh, they all ate it and didn't give you a piece. They'd be like, dude, what is this about? Right? Is this about y'all? Y'all understand that's what we do at Christmas. At Christmas is Jesus' birthday. We all show up and give each other presents and eat the food. And we're like, thanks for having a birthday, you know, right? So what we do as a church to keep our hearts in line with the reason for the season is we bring our greatest gift to the birthday boy himself. Does that make sense? So literally, like if I'm buying my wife something really nice, I add like $10 to that. I genuinely pray about it. It's not that easy. But I literally just make my most expensive gift to Jesus, That's just how God works on my heart. And that's not like, I would say if you're not, if Overflow isn't your home church, do this at your church. And watch how God keeps your heart aligned with the reason for the season. And helps you prioritize if your kid really needs that thing. (laughs) Because you're like, this is about Jesus, it's not about you. I'll teach you that early. Anyways, that's another sermon. So... But, but it's all about the birthday of Jesus. And so, but I was sitting in this room with a bunch of Christians that speak Christianese and no church talk. And I was like, all right, guys, what do your non-church friends, what do your friends that don't know God, that don't know Jesus, what do they think of when they think of Christmas? Like, what's your favorite part about Christmas outside of Jesus? That was the question I asked the room. And like immediately somebody was like, I really like the movie Elf. Anybody like Elf? Yeah. Right? So we're, the movie we're featuring on, well, tonight we're going to watch The Elf, which is awesome. That's just dope. By the way, that's like one of the easiest invites to church. 
invite a friend. If you have a friend that's like, dude, I don't do church. Like if I step into church, I, I catch on fire. You have no idea about my life, right? You know, you know those people, they're like, ah. Well, just be like, do you like the movie Elf? And they're like, yeah, I love that, that movie. I love Will Ferrell. I'll be like, come watch it. And don't worry, this isn't a bait and switch. Like Elijah isn't gonna get up halfway and present the gospel and in inter, you know, intermission. We're just eating popcorn and watching Elf and hanging out. That is an easy invite to get somebody in an environment, maybe they'd feel uncomfortable, to do something they feel comfortable doing, so that way maybe they'll come back and on a Sunday. You see how with their strategy in this? And so I was like, oh, and then somebody was like Elf, and then somebody else was like Home Alone, and then somebody was like The Grinch, and, they, and people just started shouting these Christmas movies. And I was like, oh, so like for people outside the church, Christmas is about like presents and Christmas movies, like these Christmas cinema classics. Like these are the favorite things that people enjoy that don't care about Jesus. So then the question was, how do we leverage cultural springboards to get people to the true meaning of Christmas? Does that make sense? Like some of us are still like, man, what are we doing showing secular movie clips in church? Like, does this belong in church? Does anything secular really belong in the church? And let me just like say this, like I understand that question. At Central, a church just an hour north of here doing this series, one of the elderly pastors, like I say elder, he's an older man who helps minister to the older folk in the church, actually brought that question. He said a couple of the older people came up and they were like a little upset. They were like, why are we doing this? Why are we showing secular movies in the church? And I was like, dude, thank you so much for having the courage to ask the question. As leaders, we don't mind a good, humble, honest why question. Does that make sense? If you have a question, bring all of your questions to Elijah. He will field all of them. No, I don't have to be that guy anymore, right? No. But when it's coming, like when you just go, hey, help me understand. I don't get this. That, let me break it down for you. Because some people are like, man, why are we showing secular movies in church? Can I, let me start with this. The word secular is found nowhere in your Bible. Now, it doesn't mean the word it, it doesn't exist, but it does mean it wasn't enough of a importance to put in Scripture. The Bible actually, like secular means like in worldly terms, like not of God or not of the church or not of heaven. But that word's found nowhere in the Bible. You know why? Because the Bible says that the entire earth is the Lord's and everything therein. So what we deem secular, amen, what we deem as secular is actually things that have been taken away from the kingdom of God and used by the devil and his minions, our sinful flesh or the patterns of this world for evil purposes. Does that make sense? There's actually nothing secular. There's just things that have been taken from the kingdom of God and used for evil. We've talked about this before here at Overflow. So what we as the church get to do is we get to do this incredible thing called redeeming things. The same thing Jesus did for us. I don't know if you know this, we are evil, sinful, literally the Bible calls us children of wrath. Like, how's that for a tagline? What a beautiful babel, you child of wrath, right? <laughs> like, but like, that's what we are. And God redeemed us with his son, Jesus. So we've had this literally happen in our lives. And so it is our privilege as the church to rip the tools that the enemy has taken from the kingdom of God out of his hands back into the church and use them to point people to Jesus. And say, I'm only getting like five amens. Let me take it a step further. Y'all know Jesus did this? See, like you gotta read your Bibles. Like it's so good. Like Jesus was the OG of this. Y'all have heard of the word gospel, right? If you've heard of the word gospel, raise your hand. If you haven't, we have failed you as a church because like we're all about the gospel, right? And what do you think the gospel means? Good news, right? That's what we've heard. The gospel literally translates to good news. Did you know Jesus did not come up with that word? The, the author, the originator, the main user of that word was Caesar Augustus, who was the emperor in Jesus's day. And what he would do is when the empire of Rome, the kingdom of Rome would slaughter a people group, and win new territory and expand the empire, the kingdom, Caesar Augustus would make a decree, he would make an announcement, and he would say, I have the gospel. And the gospel, the good news is, the empire, the kingdom of Rome has expanded. The kingdom of Rome is expanding. So then Jesus comes on the scene, 30, 31 years old, and Jesus says, nah, Caesar, I have a gospel. And the gospel is that the kingdom of God is at hand. This made Jesus a political revolutionary and was a very incendiary term. You see why they wanted to kill him? 
He literally, he stole the emperor's terminology and used it for the kingdom of God. The, one of the most secular pagan empires that's ever existed, Rome, he took the word from Caesar and said, let me redeem that word and use it for the kingdom. You see how we, like even Jesus did this. That's why Jesus, most of his parables were about what was happening in that day and time. They lived in an agrarian society, so he talked a lot about farming. And he, they, there was a lot of fishermen, and he talked about fishing. The three main things Jesus talked about were finances, fishing, and farming. Like, that was a lot. He, I don't know if you know this. Jesus talked more about finances than he did heaven and hell combined. Why? Because he knows our hearts think money will take care of us. And he wanted to go right at that and let you know that your wealth is a horrible God. And he is the best God. So he talked about finances a lot. And he talked about farming and fishing. Why? Because that was the culture of the day. I believe with all my heart, if Jesus showed up today, his parables would not sound the way they sounded. I think Jesus would take culturally relevant examples and teach from those to unveil the mystery that is the kingdom of God. I could see Jesus showing up and being like, the kingdom of God is like cryptocurrency. So if you take, you know what I mean? He'd be like, don't invest in Shibu or Doge. Make sure it's, you know, like whatever it is. Like, I'm kidding. Please buy Shibu. I need it to go back up. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. But, right? Let's go, right? Uh, but I, or, or Jesus would be like, the kingdom of God is like the Dow Jones or the kingdom of God. And in America, in the United States, our number one industry, our number one export is media and film. That's what we're known for around the world. Our movies, our television shows, and our music. So I have, like, I truly believe if Jesus was on this stage right now, he would relate the kingdom of God to what we culturally understand to unveil that mystery to us. And the, the disciples took this note from Jesus' playbook and they did this all the time, taking secular evil things and using them to teach people about Jesus. Don't believe me? Check out Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, the apostle Paul shows up in Athens. Athens is a pagan evil place. And they had like so many different temples and gods and idols set up, like tons of them. And, and it was evil. Like you would go to some and you would have to, of course, bring money to worship that God or bring sacrifices. Some temples you would have to do child sacrifices. Some temples you would have to sleep with prostitutes to worship that God. It was an evil place. And Paul shows up in Athens and, and the, I think it's called the Areopolis. Is that how you pronounce it, Chad? Areopolis, Areopolis. It sounds like a, a Muppet off of Sesame Street. Um, but, uh, but he shows up in this area of Athens and he's like, how am I going to get all these people that are worshiping all these evil gods to know about Jesus and believe in him? And then he finds a temple and it says inscribed on it to the unknown God. In other words, these people were so religious. They were like, just in case we don't know about a God or we miss one, we're going to make the blank God temple, you know, and just like cover all our bases. There's some people like that today. They're like, I'm going to do a little bit of yoga and I'm going to make sure I have a yin yang, but I have my cross and then I have a rosary and I'm going to do some Buddha stuff just to cover all my bases. That's called watered down religion and it won't work. And that's what these people were doing. And so Paul shows up and he goes, this secular pagan temple to the unknown God. He goes, yo. Athenians, I see you are very religious because you have so many gods. But let me tell you, I see you have a temple written to the unknown God. Let me tell you who that God is. His name is Jesus. And let me tell you why he's the only God you need. He's the capital G God. And all these lowercase g gods are actually not real. Now, we clap at that, but that was borderline heresy. Because what was he doing? Using a secular pagan temple? And he was using that to point people to Jesus. These people could have misunderstood it and started bowing down to this unknown God temple. But Paul was a good steward of the message of the gospel and he made sure they understood it. But then Paul takes it a step further. Check it, Acts chapter 17. He talks about Jesus and he quotes a secular pagan song. The, the words he uses there come from a song written by an ancient Roman writer. And it was a song written for the God of Jupiter. He takes this lyric from a secular song about another God and he puts it in reference and points it towards Jesus. That would be the equivalent of like me quoting Drake today and it ending up in the Bible. Like this happened in the Bible. So like it should be no surprise today that we can take Macaulay Culkin and use it to point people to Jesus. Amen. Because we just want to be culturally not even relevant. We want to be out in front of culture. I am so tired of the church sucking on the tailpipe of culture. 
Like culture is just taking off. We're going to space. We're creating movies and all this. And the church is like, we want to be cool too. And I'm like, I'm ready for the church to get back out in front of culture and medicine and science. And it's starting to happen. And if you are under the age of 40 or 50, man, please continue to pioneer that for the kingdom of God. Because the world deserves for the church, the people that love Jesus and actually have the wisdom of the ages, the wisdom that founded the earth. We have access to eternal universe creating power. The world needs us to step back out in front. And so that's why we can use something as silly as Home Alone to remind people we don't want you to do Christmas Home Alone. And from this point forward, hopefully if you see this movie or see this poster, you're reminded about what we're going to talk about today. All that was my intro. Y'all ready? <laughs> it's like, it's not my last sermon here, but I mean, it's the wrap up. It's the send off one. And this is the second service. So uh, I'm going to go in. If you need to leave, head out. Uh, <laughs> and so today we're going to cover the origin story of the origin story. Christmas is the origin story of Jesus' life. But how many of you know birth doesn't start at birth? Like something had to happen nine months before that, right? So that's what we're going to go to today. Luke chapter one and Matthew chapter one. We're going to start in Luke chapter one, verse 26. If you're ready, say yeah. yeah. It reads, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Everybody say Nazareth. Nazareth. Now we know that name Nazareth, because if you've been around church, you've heard Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth. Back then, nobody heard of Nazareth. Nazareth was a nowhere town. Historians tell us it maybe had like 10 to 30 families. No trade routes. Literally, it says like in history books, it had no economic value. It was a no name, no economic value, no worth, small podunk country town. That's where Jesus grew up. Anybody from a small town in here? You know what that's like? You're like, Corey, this is Benton Harbor. It's kind of small, right? No, but, but even smaller than this, like I went to high school across the street from a cotton field. And the reason I say that is because like Nazareth was one of those small towns where like everybody knows everybody business. You know what I'm talking about? It's like middle school, but for adults, like <laughs> everybody knows that. that was Nazareth. We'll come back to that in a second. So in this nowhere, no value town, here's Mary. And it said, Gabe, the angel Gabriel came to Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, greetings, oh, favored one. Somebody say favor. favor. Say greetings, oh, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid. I'll just point it out again for the thousandth time. Angels are terrifying. They're terrifying. Almost 100% of the time, almost like 98% of the time they show up in scripture, the first thing they say is, do not be afraid. You know why? Because everyone's afraid when they see them. They are terrifying, intimidating creatures. They don't look like the little figure on the top of your tree, and they definitely don't look like babies with wings, because that would not be terrifying. That would be weird. But <laughs> angels are powerful. Angels are powerful. I've said this before. When God wanted to take out thousands of Egyptians in one night, thousands upon thousands, he sent one angel. And his, this was a good guy. He was called the angel of death. How about that nickname, right? And he says, these creatures protect you and I. They're, oh my gosh, that's just a cool truth. And so Gabe shows up. He's like, ah, don't be afraid. And he says, for you have found favor with God. Somebody say favor. favor. How many of you want God's favor on your life? Right? Amen. How many of you want favor on your marriage? Anybody? Favor on your career. Anybody want favor on your finances? Come on, somebody about to get Pentecostal up in here, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. But we do, right? We, we want God's favor. So here's Gabriel, and he comes to Mary in the nowhere town of Nazareth and says, you have God's favor. Well, let's see what God's favor looked like. Matthew chapter 1. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph... Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being, just, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. So here you have Mary and Joseph. Let me give you some context. Mary is, um, I said in the first service, between ages 14 to 18, probably more accurately, she was probably between age of 12 to 14. As soon as a, a girl in that day and time could bear children, they were to enter into marriage. Multiple reasons. I know that seems shocking in our day and time, but back then, first off, life expectancy, what it isn't, was it was, how am I, what am I trying to say? It wasn't what it is today. Thank you. Yeah. Like you would only live to like maybe be 30, 40, maybe 50 if you got real old. Does that make sense? So if you want to have kids and grandkids, you had to start early. Second to that, like the men would be ages, you know, like 20, 25, maybe even 30. In other words, like 
the men wouldn't look for a wife until they could provide for one. That's a good principle. <laughs> Just throwing it out there, right? Ladies, who are you looking for? <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and, and the women, you know, they could start making children. And that was the main thing there. So they were engaged. There's engagement where the husband would go to the, the parents and be like, hey, um, can we make this thing happen? Yeah. And, and you know, and, and so they were engaged. And then there's betrothal. Betrothal is when you're legally married, but you haven't done the ceremony and you haven't made the covenant before God. So there's like legal marriage in the eyes of the government. And then that, that legal time would last like 30, 90 at the most, like 12, like 30 days, 90 days at the most 12 months. And it was like this season that kind of felt like engagement, but they were legally married, but they wouldn't even like a lot of like towns wouldn't let you hang out together because they didn't want any rumors that maybe you had consummated the marriage before you made the covenant. I don't know if you know this marriage is not a legal contract. It was first and foremost, a covenant before God. The only reason our governments get involved is just to recognize our religious covenant, our belief in covenant of God. Does that make sense? Like marriage is about covenant before it's about a contract in government. A lot of us think, oh, marriage, if I can get out of it legally, then whatever. But like when, when two people stand on an altar and you make a covenant, you, some of you need to study covenant. It's a powerful word. A covenant is when two parties would come together and make an agreement. And the only party that can break a covenant is the more powerful party. So if two kings made a covenant so they wouldn't like invade, if they ever wanted to break covenant, the more powerful one was the only one that could do that. So when a, a husband and wife come to an altar, it, you're not just making a covenant with each other. You're making a covenant with God. So technically, God's the only one that can end your marriage. I'm just going to say that. Now, I'm not like anti-divorce when there's like abuse or infidelity or anything like that. I'm not, and many of us in here may have gone through divorce. I, this isn't a sermon on that. But for some of you that are younger, like I know like Joel and Taylor, like they're in that engagement series when they, in, in that season. When they stand on the altar, it's cool to know that, hey, we're making a covenant not just with each other, but with God. And the good part about that is God's got you and he's, he is stronger. He is more powerful. Like a three cord strand, you are not easily broken. Just two, it's not going to work. But three, he keeps you together. Oh, that's so strong. Anyways, so they haven't made that yet, but they are legally married. And we all, who said you want God's favor in your life? Okay. What did God's favor look like in Mary's life? We just read it. Here's what God's favor looked like in Mary's life. Unplanned teenage pregnancy and my husband's divorcing me. How many of you want God's favor? Fewer hands now. Thank you for your courage, right? Will you ever think about it like that? Oh, favored one. Oh, yeah, I'm favored. See, what a lot of us don't know is just like Kevin in Home Alone, like if you saw that Kevin in Home Alone, he was like, I'm living alone. Kevin had a Christmas wish. He had a desire in his wish and his desire that I would be alone, that I would have no family. But his wish didn't come to fruition the way he thought it would. He got his wish and it actually ended up in loneliness and him being under attack, if you've seen the movie. In Jewish heritage, like in this day and time, the wish, the desire, like the Disney princess for every Jewish girl would be, what if I could be the mother of the Messiah? Because the prophecy had been made that the Messiah would come out of the line of David. So if you were a young Jewish girl, it was your dream to maybe be the mother of Messiah. So here's Mary, Gabe shows up. Yo, you gonna be the mom of the Messiah? What? I got my dream. And what did her dream look like? Oh, you're, you're a teen and you won't get pregnant and your husband's going to divorce you. Isn't it funny how sometimes favor don't feel like favor? I think some of us, we pray for things, then God starts to answer our prayers and it doesn't feel good. So we actually run out of God's favor as opposed to staying in it. Like this was a blessing, but I bet it felt more like a burden unplanned teenage pregnancy and her husband's leaving her. Thanks, God. <laughs> Appreciate the favor. <laughs> Don't do me any more favors, right? Like, it gives a new meaning to home alone. Because again, she's in a small town and this is scandalous. People didn't get pregnant like that back in the day. And so she's scandalized, probably socially ostracized, and the one person that's supposed to love is leaving her. 
I love what it says about Joseph. I don't have time to, I would love to do a whole sermon on Joseph. Call it like stepdad of the ages. I don't know if you know this, like Joseph was Jesus' stepdaddy. That wasn't his boy. You talk about the power of a step parent. He raised the savior of the world. Some of you out here, maybe you're a step parent. Never underestimate the influence you have in that child's life. Amen. Amen. We applaud you guys. And, uh, and it says, Joseph, being a just man, resolved to divorce her quietly. He was a just man, but he was also just a man. My like, fellas, let's be real. Your wife, girlfriend, fiance comes to you today. She says, babe, got some news. I'm pregnant. You know, if you're married, you're like, wait, what? Um, if you're not married, you're like, what? <laughs> and then she says, um, but it's not your baby. Now, at that point, I'm just a man. I'm going, you cheating son, right? Like, I mean, let's be real, guys. And she goes, no, 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 babe. It's okay. God did it. You going to play the God card? Oh, we going to do a DNA test. You better believe it. Right? Yeah, better come out glowing in that if it's really the Holy Spirit, that DNA. Like, like, fellas, it's happened once already. And if this happened today, you would be hard pressed to believe that girl. That's why Joseph, like, he was a just man, but he was just a dude. But did you catch what it said? It said he resolved to leave her quietly, to divorce her quietly as not to shame her. Real men don't shame their women. Real Christ followers don't shame their brothers and sisters. I like, instead of expose her, because again, if it was modern day, we're putting that girl on blast. I mean, I'm posting on social media, this cheating, bleep, 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 right? Like, um, uh, no, not really, but you know what I mean, right? Like in modern day time, we want to call people out for their mistakes. We want to shame people. We, wanna, we live in a cancel culture. We are professional shamers. You could have tweeted something 20 years ago and we're like, shame, right? And it's like, dude, like I'm grown now. Like, give me a break. I've, I've evolved as a person. Like, and we just so good at shame and I'm just tired of this. And what, here's the way I like to say it. It says because he loved her, he, 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 he didn't want to shame her. Love doesn't shame. Love doesn't expose people in their sin. Love covers people. Love covers people. Now, let me be clear. Love does not cover up sin. That's a different thing. In other words, like if you're in an abusive marriage, we're not going to put them on blast and tell that stuff to everybody in the church or anything like that. But there still are consequences and accountability that needs to. Does that make sense? You need to tell somebody, but we ain't about putting you on blast. It, one of my favorite examples of this, of love covers, not shames and exposes. You know the story of Noah, right? Noah, big boat, lots of animals. Yeah. Noah. Yeah. Um, if you read the whole narrative of Noah, after he got off the boat, Noah was a drunk, like drunk. Some of you are like, really? Yeah, it's in the Bible. It's crazy. You know, like all of our big biblical heroes were just massive screw ups. Like every single person in the Bible outside of Jesus and this one guy named Melchizedek, like everybody else, like royal screw ups. Makes me feel good about myself. Amen. Like, whew, man, God used them. Come on, he can still use us. But Noah was a drunk, not just a drunk. There's a story after Noah got off the boat where Noah got wasted, like, like pass out, naked drunk, wasted. Anybody ever been like that? I'm just kidding. Don't raise your hand on that. <laughs> <laughs> the lady in the back was like, yeah, it was last night. No, I'm just, uh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, but no, seriously, it's in the Bible. Some of you are like, that's in the Bible? It's in the Bible. Noah got naked, pass out, drunk, partying in a cave by himself. <laughs> How many of you have had those nights? Isn't that right? We've all been there. Um, he's just like doing this, and he passed out naked, drunk. And what happens in the story, in the narrative, it says one of his younger sons comes to the cave, and they see there, he sees his dad in his nakedness and his shame. And it says the younger son runs and tells some of the other brothers. In other words, the younger son exposes their father in his shame. 
So what do the older brothers do? It says the older brothers hear from the younger brother. They come to the edge of the cave and it, you can read it. It's beautiful. It said they turn their backs to the cave and they hold a blanket between one another and they walk in backwards as to not see their father. And then they lay a blanket over his nakedness. Love covers people in their shame. That's what I mean by that. And it said Noah, when he awoke, he cursed the younger son and blessed the older ones. Because what do we do when we hear about something? We often run and tell people that's called gossip. Gossip is one of the most toxic sins that you can ever partake in. It ticks me off to my core that we fire people from the church and we make it this huge deal when there's infidelity. But a pastor or his wife could be gossiping nine times out of 10. And I've I've never heard of a pastor fired for gossip. But gossip will tear a church apart way more than infidelity will. Isn't it funny how we like pick and choose what sins we really press in on? Like here's another one. Like Christ followers, we are called to be hospitable. Pastors are actually a requirement for being an elder, a leader, or any type of leader in the church is hospitality. I've never heard of a pastor getting fired because he has no one over at his house. But the Bible actually says that's a requirement. So everybody's invited to Elijah's house when he finally gets one. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Give him time. They're literally like homeless right now. Anyway, but so, so my point here, love covers. We don't shame people. We don't gossip about people. Like I've heard people recently like say like, oh man, did you hear about so-and-so? Man, this is how we mask it in church. We mask it as prayer requests. Hey, man, how do you think I could best be praying for them? Did you hear what they're going through? Da, 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 da. Oh, no, I, I'm team Abby. I'm team Abby all the way. How can we be praying for what's she going through? Oh, my God. Da, 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 da. First off, if you don't stop and pray, you're gossiping. Second, if you're team Abby, pick up the phone and call Abby. This, I'm sorry I'm using you as this example. She has nothing going on in her life, but like negative. But is that making sense? Instead of talking about the person, talk with the person. We have phones now. If you're really for that person, pick up the phone, get the story from the source, and then, this is crazy, pray for them. Could you imagine a church that did that? Ah, That would be amazing. I just love it. So so here, sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. These are all soapboxes, and I'm about to slip off. i got to get back to my narrative here. So it says, Mary's home alone. Her husband's leaving her. She's got unplanned pregnancy. Favor, doesn't feel like favor. Blessing, feels like a burden. So what does she do? Luke chapter one, verse 39. How does Mary handle her loneliness? Because I know in a room this size and people watching online at a church like this, some people are struggling with loneliness this holiday season. Like y'all know, like anti-anxiety medication goes up, like consumed more in December. Y'all know suicide rates goes, go up in December. It's because people think everybody else is so happy and they're not. And, it, and it, especially with social media, dear God, right? And, and, and that huge juxtaposition just drives people into that loneliness and that depression. And I think if you're feeling like that, I mean, y'all know you can be surrounded by people and still feel alone, you know? Here's Mary about to be socially ostracized. Her husband's divorcing her. But she felt alone. So how'd she handle it? Luke chapter one, verse 39. In those days, what days? When her husband was divorcing her. In those days, what days? When she's pregnant by herself. In those days, what days? When she doesn't know what's going to happen next. In those days, it said Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country. Now I had that word arose highlight. Everybody say arose on the count of three. One, two, three. Now another translation says Mary got up. Everybody say get up. One, two, three. Look at your neighbor and tell him get up. Tell somebody to get up. Get up, get up, get up. Anybody sitting by yourself? Get up, get up. I got you, right? Here's what I love. In those days, what days? When she was down, when she didn't know what was coming, when favor felt more like failure, when blessing felt more like burden. In those days, it said Mary got up. Arose implies, get up implies that you are down. Now, she could have been down metaphorically. She could have been down physically on her knees or laying in bed. I personally think it alludes to emotionally. When you're down, And I just wanted to tell somebody today, maybe you're struggling with loneliness. Maybe you're struggling in some way, shape or form. Maybe you're watching this online at another time. And this word is just for you. I just wanted to tell somebody today, get up, get up, get up. Just, and here's what I mean. I've had those days where I want to leave the curtains closed and I want to pull the comforter back over my head and I just want to stay in bed. 
But those are the exact days when you need to get up. You need to get up. You just, just, and you're like, but I don't know what to do. It's okay. Just get up. Just keep getting up. Just get up. I, I preached this message last week at Central and a young girl, and, and she's like 21 years old. She came up to me after service, just tears in her eyes. And she said, I didn't want to get up and come to church today. She was like, I don't want to get up at all this last week. I am struggling with suicidal thoughts and depression. And I just needed somebody to tell me I, I can get up. And so I'm just telling somebody today, there's hope. Just get up. Just get up. And I love that Mary had the wherewithal to get up. And it says she arose. She got up and went with haste into the hill country. But where did she go? When you get up, where do you go? And it says that she, she got up and went to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth was her older cousin. Elizabeth got the messenger. Gabriel came to her six months prior and told Elizabeth she was going to get pregnant. Zachariah and Elizabeth got a prophecy from Gabe and he was like, you're going to be pregnant. Now, Elizabeth was old and barren. So this was a miracle baby, too, before Jesus. It's crazy. Like this story is insane. And, but the cool thing is, is there was, was a miracle baby, but it wasn't an immaculate conception. This was like regular conception. Like Zachariah got to be a part of this. Right. Yay, Zach. Um, is that? Joseph got the short end of the stick in this deal, but um, sorry, I get my mind gets real practical with these stories. But I love that it says like Mary got up on her own and she went. See, sometimes, especially in, in Christmas seasons and tough seasons, like sometimes you just got to be why be. Some of you know what that means. Anybody know what that means? No. Right. right? I'm not talking about a beverage, but it does. Right. No, by be why be, I mean, be your own Barnabas. One of my favorite biblical, y'all know the big purple dinosaur, Barney? I'm like, I don't even know how he sounds. Like, oh, Barney, I don't know. Um, you know, we get that name Barney from Barnabas, and it actually literally translates, it's from this guy in Acts. Barnabas means the encourager. There was this dude that was so encouraging, they named him Mr. Encouragement. <laughs> like, that would just be dope. Like, yeah, that's just cool. That'd be like naming, like, you're so good at bass. I'd be like, you are now Mr. Bass, right? And he's like, what? But he, they changed it. Barnabas means the encourager. And, and David, King David says it like this in 1 Samuel. He sa it says, King David strengthened himself in the Lord. King David encouraged himself in the Lord. Sometimes we have to BYOB. Sometimes we got to get up. Sometimes we have to be our own Barnabas. Sometimes we got to get up and look in the mirror and say, man, it doesn't feel like favor. It doesn't feel like blessing. But I know and I believe I am a child of God. You do have a plan for me, God. I am a victor in you. I am more than a conqueror in you. And I don't care what it feels like. I don't care what they're saying about me in the nowhere town of Nazareth. I know what you have promised me. If you've said it, I believe it. You got to be wild be. And so she, she does that. She be wild be. She gets up and then she goes to her older cousin, Elizabeth. The second thing, if you're handling, handling loneliness or third thing, yeah, you got to get up. Yeah, you got to be wild be. But you got to go to your family. Now, when I say that immediately, some are like, Corey, you do not know my family. I don't, I don't mean your physical blood family. I mean your spiritual family. Elizabeth was a believer in God. And she was an older, more seasoned saint. Millennials, Gen Z, can I just throw it out there? When you're going through junk, sure, have some peers you talk it through with. But don't just get advice from people your age. Get advice from people ahead of you in life that have been through it a little bit. Come on, right? We are. We are. But, but here's the other side of that coin. If you are a more seasoned saint, if you, we need some patriarchs and matriarchs in the church. If you're above the age of like 40, 50, 60, we need you. We need your wisdom. We need your love. We need to communicate with you. And it feels weird. It feels like there's this communication barrier. Like older people, like even my mother sometimes, she's like, oh, you know, the Facebook, the Instagram, the talk tick and all that stuff. She's like, I don't know how to, and you're always communicating with emojis. I don't know how to talk to you, right? I'm like, well, just try and we'll try and we'll laugh about it. But we need each other. And you know one of the number one ways you can get around older, more seasoned believers and actually communicate with them? It, it, yeah, it, what, did you say bingo? That, yeah, you could go play bingo, that's true. I don't know if those are seasoned believers, seasoned gamblers, but yes. Um, but thank you for participating, that means a lot. Here, here's one of the number one ways I've seen it. Serve at church. 
Because like small groups are usually based about your season in life. So you'll go to a small group and it'd be like, oh, we're all couples or oh, we're all singles or oh, we're all 20 somethings. That's cool. We, that's intentional. But when you serve, you get around people of different ethnicities, different cultures, different age ranges. Like, like practical example, Gary Bennett and his wife, Debbie, they are older, more seasoned saints. And this entire last year, they have spoken into me. They have prayed over me. They have been those people for me. Even in between services, I was standing right here and they were prophesying with me and sharing words of encouragement with me. And I was telling them about what's going on in my life and my marriage and stuff. And they were there for me as older, more seasoned saints because I've chosen to give my life to Christ and I've chosen to help build his church and serve. If you need this, jump in and start serving. And that goes for the older folk too. We need you. We need you. And so she goes to her older cousin, Elizabeth. And she's getting godly advice. for. But here, check out the first thing Liz says to her. Because some of us need to be a Beth for somebody this Christmas. Some of us need to be a Liz for somebody, Elizabeth. And it says, she gets to Elizabeth. And Elizabeth says, blessed are you. So it says, Mary comes in. The baby leaped in Elizabeth's womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she explained, explain, exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you, Mary. Now, first off, did you see what the filling of the Holy Spirit does? When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you encourage people. I'm so sick of people being like, we're a Holy Spirit church. Well, you sound evil. Because a true fruit of the Holy Spirit is kindness, gentleness, self-control. And here it says she was filled with the Holy Spirit. And what's the first thing she says to Mary? Mary busts through the door and she says, you're blessed. And if I'm Mary, I'm going, I don't feel blessed. I feel lonely. Did you know Joe is divorcing me? Did you know everybody in my nowhere town in Nazareth is talking trash about me? I don't feel blessed. But what does Liz say? You're blessed. You're blessed. In other words, she went and got around somebody that would call her up, not call her out. Oh, God. I am so tired of the church being a place where we call people out and I'm ready for the church to be the place where we call people up. And there is a drastic difference. Like if somebody comes to me and like, oh, Corey, I messed up. I did X, Y, Z or man, I'm sinning in this area of my life or friends come to me. Like I've heard churches, I've heard people go, don't, well, don't do that. Don't you do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. I don't say that anymore. At least I try not to. Because what is that? That's judgment and that's action oriented. It's, con it's condemning, and that's not who we are. That's exactly what I say. And say, saying, don't do that, I'll say, hey, that's not who you are. Yeah. That's not who you are. I know who you are. You are a son or a daughter of the Most High God. Amen. You are a victor. You are more than a conqueror. You, we're going to pick you up. We're going to help get you up. And I'm not calling you out. I'm calling you up to who God's created you to be. I am so blessed with a family, with parents that have modeled this for me. Like, I, just like two weeks ago, I was talking to my mom and going through some stuff, and, and my mom just said, she goes, Corey, it's going to be okay. Corey, it's going to be fine. Corey, you got this. Corey, God's got you. Just call me up. Just call me up. Call. My dad's famous. My dad will always say, Corey, remember who you are, and then he'll always say this to me. He'll go, this too shall pass, chin up, shoulders back. Chin up, shoulders back. In other words, we do not walk around like this. We do not. This is not who we are. This is who we are. We are children of the king. So even if it sucks right now, even if it's awful right now, this too shall pass and in the end we win. But some of us come from families and cultures where anything positive happens and we all have that relative or that friend and they just bash it, right? You're like, I just bought some land. I'm going to build a house. And they're like, well, you don't know anything about that. And you're like, dude, I, that was a good thing. And you're like, well, no, I'm going to get builders. And they're like, well, I hope you trust them. <laughs> what are you talking like, you know, it's like, it's like, dude, can you please be positive, right? Some of us may need for a season, those people need Jesus, but for a season, we may need to kind of stiff arm those relationships because the, the mind builds pathways, yeah. neurological pathways. When you do and hear things over and over and over again, that's why some of you, when bad things happen, you make them worse. Yeah. And when good things happen, you make them bad. Because you have taught your mind, because you're around people like that and you started internalizing it yourself to only take things that direction. That's why the Bible says in Romans chapter 12 that we are to be transformed by what? The renewing of our mind. 
The Bible was speaking to neurological pathways way back before they were even discovered because God knew if you want new life and if you want new actions, it starts with new thoughts. And it doesn't just happen in a moment. You have to redig those pathways by positive repetition in your mind. That's why we come to church every Sunday. That's why the Bible says do not neglect gathering together because we got to remind ourselves of this. We got to get around people that will call us up. And that's what Mary did. And Elizabeth said, you are blessed. She called her up. And then the story continues. Don't worry, I'll land the plane here in like an hour and a half. Um, no, real quick, real quick. She said, you are blessed. And why is this granted to me, Elizabeth talking, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. I'm going to pause there for two seconds. And I'm going to try and say this with as much grace, mercy, and love as I can with a sensitive heart to this topic. As I know in, a, in an audience this size, and watching online, um, I know for a fact, actually, that there are women here that may have terminated or, or had an abortion, terminated a pregnancy or had an abortion. And let me first just say this. If that's you, we love you so much. And we don't shame you. We don't look down on you. We don't judge you. We don't know what was going on in your life. We don't know what you went through. And I want you to know that this is a safe place. This is a place of healing. And God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And what the enemy meant for evil, God can still use for good. But I want to pause on this in light of that. Because I don't know if you noticed that. Elizabeth is six months pregnant. Mary's like one month pregnant. And the fetus in Elizabeth's womb who would then become John the Baptist, Jesus' older cousin that prepared the way, the fetus in Elizabeth's womb recognized the divinity in Mary's womb. In other words, there was not only cognitive awareness in the womb, but there was spiritual awareness in the, room, in the womb. There may be one person watching this now or in the future, and maybe you have an unplanned pregnancy you're dealing with and you are considering terminating that pregnancy. And I just wanna let you know that this word is for you right now that just because it's unplanned doesn't mean that God can't use it. It doesn't mean that God doesn't have a plan. Just because it doesn't feel like favor doesn't mean it's not God's favor on your life. And even if the enemy meant it for evil, God can use it for good. That baby has a purpose and just use this as the word or the affirmation for you today. There is a purpose and a plan for that baby. That baby is a gift. I just wanted to say that to somebody. And so here this happens, and, and we'll fast forward. And then Mary replies to Elizabeth. And in your Bibles, it would say like the, uh, the prayer of Mary or the song of Mary. But this is like 13-year-old Mary's reply. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. God, that's incredible. For he who, I mean, all generations will call me. You know what blessing felt like for her? I got all this tension with my husband. I think he's leaving me. I got all this like spotlight on me and shame on me. And then I'm going to raise a child, follow him around so that people can kill him. And for generations, people are calling me blessed because I watch him kill my son. Man, the Bible is scandalous. Take, in, take like real stock of what Jesus did for us. Take real stock of what God can do through a faithful young woman, through a faithful young man. He can change the world. Mary says, all generations will call me blessed for he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud and the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with Elizabeth about three months and returned to her home. A couple things I'll point out and then we'll land the plane. First one, it says she was with Elizabeth for three months. Elizabeth was already six months pregnant. What does that tell us? Mary was probably there for the birth of John the Baptist. Why is that significant? Because sometimes watching someone go through something difficult and come out on the side encourages you when you're about to go through it. Again, who are you getting advice from? Who are you following? 
Going, going to people that have experience is a helpful thing. Second thing we see here, I pointed out Mary was probably 12, 13 years old. If you read your Bible, you probably picked up on the majority of what she just prayed was Old Testament scripture. You want to handle your loneliness? Your soul is thirsty? Go to the fire hydrant that is the word of God. A 12-year-old girl knew that much scripture. She wasn't reading that. She was reciting that from memory as our prayer. The majority of that was actually Hannah's prayer in the Old Testament when Hannah found out she was pregnant. Mary's 12, 13. It doesn't matter how old you are. You get scripture in your heart. God will help it. Well, God will use it to help you in times of trouble. And I'll land it here. Did you catch what Mary said at the beginning? In those days... When her husband was divorcing her, unplanned pregnancy, potentially socially ostracized, she gets up, she goes to her family, they encourage her, and then she responds. And she responds by saying, my soul magnifies. This is a magnifying glass. And what a magnifying glass does, whatever you look at through it becomes bigger and everything else proportionally looks smaller. Some of you are like, duh. <laughs> I just wanna point this out. So Mary said, my soul, my heart, in those days, my soul, my heart, my attention, my focus, my eyes, I will magnify my problem. That's not what she said. I will magnify the fact that he's leaving me. No. I will magnify the fact that I may not have a home. No. She said, even in these days, even in the days where I could be down and depressed and alone and lonely, and, and when a blessing feels like a burden and favor feels more like failure, in these days, my soul will not magnify the problem. My soul will magnify the praise of my Savior. My soul will magnify the Lord. So... What, what are you magnifying? Let's get practical. What are you actually magnifying this month? What are you magnifying today? What are you focusing on? I, I wrote a few down that are just relevant to me in different seasons. Did you lose a job? Oh, God. <laughs> Layoffs and cutbacks. What am I going to do? Did you lose a job? Or have you gained a newfound freedom to learn and step into something new? Amen. How are you framing it? See, some of us this holiday season, we need to raise our gaze a bit. We're so focused and we just keep magnifying the negative. Did you lose that job or did you gain an opportunity? How are you framing it? What are you magnifying? Did you fail the assignment or did you find a chance to learn? We say it all the time here at Overflow and Water's Edge Family of Churches. When we fail, we fail forward. We fail forward. We're going to fail a lot, but we fail forward. Oh, I failed. I'm so stupid. I'm so dumb. No, I've learned from that and I'm going to grow. What are you magnifying? My soul will magnify the Lord. Did that relationship die or have you stepped into a new season of growth? What are you, ma- I, I, I keep going. I know you guys are loving these. Are you alone? God, I'm so alone. Nobody likes me. Nobody's around me. Are you alone or are you alive? Hey God, I may not got any friends right now, but I'm breathing. <laughs> I got breath. It could be worse. I could be dead. I'm alive today. I'm going to focus on that. I'm going to magnify that. What are you magnifying this month? Are you sick or are you saved? I've been around people. Oh, man, I got COVID. I got COVID. I've been around. I got cancer. I remember I said this in the first service. My dad was diagnosed with cancer. And his first response when he told me over the phone, and it's like a nuclear bomb when someone you love drops the C word. And when he said it to me, I'll never forget his first response was, man, praise God, I found out as early as I did. That's literally the next sentence out of his mouth. And I'll never forget he was in the hospital and about to go in for his surgery to try and remove the cancer. And the doctor told him, hey, you could die. And my dad was cracking jokes with the nurses and the doctors. I mean, there was like rumbling laughter coming out of there. And I remember I went in right, I was like, dad, man, I know you're a lighthearted guy, but come on, like, this is a serious moment. He goes, what do you want me to do? Be sad, why? I'm saved, I know where I'm going if I die. You see what he was magnifying? I may have cancer, but if it takes me out, let's go. I know where I'm going, I'm saved. 
The joy of the Lord is my strength. This doesn't come easy, by the way. This isn't natural. That's why it's called supernatural. Amen. It's in the Holy Spirit that we're able to do this. And finally, add this one. Thinking of Mary dealing with Joseph. Did they leave you? Or is he with you? Did they abandon you? Did they leave? Did they walk away from you? Or, I mean, you can magnify that. And rightly so, that stuff hurts. Or, you can magnify the fact that he never leaves you or forsakes you. He will always be with you. They may have left, but you never will, and you never have, and you are with me, God. My soul magnifies the Lord. What are you magnifying this month? God, that, that's why these little sheets of paper, this is dumb. This is a business card with a church invite on it, right? It's cost two cents. But this is like, I've seen these change people's souls for eternity. These matter because people are stuck magnifying the wrong things this Christmas. People feel alone. And just by going, hey, you like the movie Elf? Yeah, Will Ferrell's dope. Okay. Come to church. What? How does that have to do with each other? Come find out. That's why these matter. They're so sad. I have heard story after story of people getting invited, like a waitress or like somebody, you know, like, ah, and they take it and they're like, thanks. And they put it in their pocket. And then what I, I literally, I've heard this story twice in my life. Somebody put it in their back pocket. Months later, they're doing laundry. Their life's falling apart in tears. And out of the dryer, they pull this crumpled up, wrinkled invite card because somebody cared enough to invite them. And they show up at church. God changes their life, changes the trajectory of their soul, all from a silly piece of paper. But it's because somebody cared and they wanted to let them know that you are never alone. God is with you. God is with you. And we are with you. And I just wanted to remind somebody of that today. Maybe we're going to sing one more song, and as we sing it, I would just ask that you stay seated. Maybe even close your eyes and let the truth of the song just kind of wash over you. But the idea of it is sometimes we just need to be still and remember that God is with us. Jesus, thank you. Just thank you for the boldness and courage of Mary. Thank you for Joseph being real with what he was thinking and what we can learn and glean from that. And God, right now, I just pray that you would move in this room and online. Anybody watching, feeling alone right now? That in this still moment, you would remind us that we are never alone. And you are always with us.